Hey everyone, in this video I have a conversation with Aubrey de Grey, one of the world's leading researchers in the field of longevity. He says we can end aging. His investors include for example the PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel or the Ethereum inventor Vitalik Buterin. So let's jump right into it. So Aubrey, thanks for taking time. Um, I believe we met each other first about four years ago and I remember two sentences you said back then. The first one was aging is the world's most severe problem and the yeah. second one is aging is a consequence of physics not biology so could you tell us what you mean by that uh well the um when i say aging is the world's most important problem it's very simple i i just mean that aging causes more suffering than anything else in the world and um you know that's not terribly hard to justify it yeah. causes 90% of our medical budget, for example. Uh, when we come to aging being a phenomenon of physics rather than biology, there we have to get a little bit more detailed. Um, aging is a phenomenon of physics in the sense that it is the same phenomenon as what we see when we look at the aging of a simple man-made machine, like a car. Um, people often overlook this because they don't appreciate what aging is in living organisms um, and point out that aging is simply the lifelong accumulation in the body of a variety of different types of damage that are self-inflicted. In other words, they are consequences of the body's normal operation. And the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that damage, but only a certain amount, which means that, of course, eventually we get to the point where the body starts to go downhill in terms of its function and eventually it ceases to function at all. So if we think about that definition of aging, then we can see immediately that it is exactly the same as we could use if we were defining the aging of a simple man-made machine. Well, once one understands that aging is simply a phenomenon of physics, then of course the question of why people age, or indeed why any other living organism ages, becomes the same question as why do cars age or aeroplanes? Yeah. And there we kind of we don't have a problem with it. We kind of regard it as not surprising. Um, and you also often talk about rejuvenation. Uh, does that not only mean that we kind of stop aging, but we become even younger and get rid of our wrinkles? Or what do you mean by that? This is exactly the point. So once one thinks about the process of aging as the accumulation of damage, then it's easy to see that the most effective and feasible approach to keeping the damage below the threshold that is problematic late in life, or in other words, delaying the point at which that threshold is reached, is not <clears throat> to somehow make the body run more cleanly and generate damage more slowly, but rather to repair damage after it's been laid down, but before it has reached this level of abundance that causes pathologies. If we, again, go back to the analogy with simple machines, you know, there's only so much we can do to stop a car from rusting without, you know, as long as we do actually take it out in the rain every so often. Um, and yet uh, we see that we can successfully keep cars in uh, the same state, same function as when they were built for as long as we like. There are, car <clears throat> there are cars that are more than 100 years old. Why? Simply because the owners of those cars remove the rust every yeah. so often, you know, before the doors fall off. And that is simply rejuvenation. So, yes, absolutely. This is not a case of keeping the level of damage static. This is the case of actually reducing the level of damage. In other words, restoring somebody to a younger biological age than they were before you treated them. And so what's your thesis? How old do we actually get? We therefore need to look at the question of the side effect. You know, at the end of the day, today, people don't tend to die very much from, you know, in, in the developed world anyway, from hypothermia or starvation or being eaten by lions. Um, and mostly we die from getting sick. I mean, of course, also people die from being hit by a truck and so on. But uh, most people die from being sick. And most people get sick from being old. Most of the... Um, types of disease that we get early in life or that we used to get early in life, we don't get anymore because we've figured out how to stop that from happening. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, this means that 
if and when we bring aging under complete medical control by developing comprehensive rejuvenation, then the likelihood is that people on average will live a great deal longer than they do now. Now, we definitely can't put a number on how long they would live because we're talking about complete rejuvenation, which means that we will simply never see the damage in the body rising to the level that makes us sick. We, of course, still will have other causes of death, like, again, being hit by trucks and so on. Yeah. But, of course, the, it, the, the magnitude of those risks will also be subject to future technology. So we just totally can't put a number on it. Does this also mean we get rid of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and then you can, prob you can basically solve all those big problems out there? It's absolutely essential to understand that we should not be calling things like Alzheimer's disease, disease or Parkinson's disease, we should not be calling them diseases because they are simply parts of aging. Okay. Any disease, as we call it, which actually affects older people and does not affect young adults is part of aging. The only way that it can be age-related like that is if it is the consequence of having been alive a long time which of course all the things that we might not call diseases that we call aging itself that's true of those as well so it's actually very counterproductive to call these things diseases we should use the word disease only for things that make people sick early in life and everything else should be called aging and how about if we turn like 200 years old do you think we develop new kind of diseases or consequences of being that old? It's always possible <clears throat> that there are other types of damage in the body that accumulate so slowly that in a currently normal lifetime, they do not actually contribute to the ill health of old age. Whereas if we live maybe twice as long as we currently do, then they would start to matter. We cannot 100% exclude that, but we can 99% exclude it. Because the thing is, All of these types of damage that accumulate, even though we don't have built-in damage repair mechanisms for them, which is, of course, as I said, why they accumulate in the first place, nevertheless, we do have mechanisms that slow down the rate at which they accumulate relative to how it would be you know, by default. So those mechanisms are, of course, genetically encoded. And that means that they are subject to natural selection. Yeah. And that means that the quality of that retardation of damage is going to kind of even out. It's going to be the same for different types of damage, because otherwise there would not be any selection for um, maintaining it at that quality, and it would decline and become less good. So it's likely, just from an evolutionary perspective, that every type of damage that's ever going to matter already matters at least a little bit, and therefore we already know about it. So how do you manipulate your, your body or how do you help your body sustain? Do, you, do people consume health supplements? Do they put nanobots into their bodies or how do you treat people? Um, well, the treatments are many and varied. There are many different types of damage that we already know about that do accumulate. Mm -hmm. The only thing that really makes this practical in the near term is that we can classify those many types of damage into a, into a much smaller, manageable number of categories. I normally talk about just seven categories, and other people have come up with similar classifications that you know, six or eight or nine, but it's basically all the same idea. Um, so these seven categories, each of them has a generic solution. Uh, so without, without going through them all, uh, let me just use one, one as an example, loss of cells. One type of damage is when cells die and they are not automatically replaced by the division of other cells. And if that happens, then, of course, the number of cells in the relevant tissue declines over time, and eventually there are not enough cells for the tissue to do its job. So the generic fix for that, obviously, is stem cell therapy, to put cells back into the body that we've engineered in the lab into the right state so that they know what to do. You can put them in and they will divide and transform themselves into replacements for the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. And will this treatment be available for everyone or what's your goal or only for the rich? Of course, my goal is that these treatments will be available to absolutely everybody who is old enough to need them. And I don't think that that's going to be at all difficult. Today, of course, we do see a huge amount of limitation of access to high-tech um, medicines for the elderly uh, that are expensive. 
um, on the basis of ability to pay. But the reason that society tolerates that is because those medicines basically don't work. So all they do is they push out the time that we spend in a bad state of health at the end of life by a small amount. You know, that's not really very attractive. And so there are no votes in, you know, throwing proper taxpayers' money at the problem. Whereas once we have therapies that do work, that's not going to be the same at all. And even if we ignore the electoral aspect that I just mentioned, uh, if we just look at the purely mercenary economic argument, these therapies are going to pay for themselves many times over incredibly quickly, mm. simply because it's less expensive to keep people in a good state of health than it is to treat them. And furthermore, these people will still be useful and able-bodied and able to continue to contribute wealth to society. And I'm sure you get this question asked a lot, but what about overpopulation on our planet? So people, the, 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 one, of the, one of the most <clears throat> painful demonstrations of how poorly people think about the whole question of aging is that they will often ask the question about only for the rich and the question about overpopulation yeah. consecutively, as if they could both be true at the same time. Right. Um, to come to the real specific answer to the question, of course, the answer is simply that the problem of overpopulation is not a problem of having enough space. At the moment, you know, you could give every single person on the earth more than one acre of land and you'd still not run out of land. Um, now, of course, population will go up, But the rate at which it will go up is far more slow, far slower than most people imagine when they just think about this problem. And what we have to ask, therefore, is will the um, <clears throat> overpopulation problem actually get worse? And, it, and since it's not about space, what is it about? It's about pollution. It's about the amount of you know, greenhouse gases we're putting into the environment or plastics that we're generating or whatever. And the thing is, We are solving those problems already. The technologies that will eliminate those problems and therefore increase the carrying capacity of the planet are already much further along than the technology to eliminate aging. I'm talking, of course, about you know, solar energy and wind energy actually being cheaper than fossil fuels. So that means that we don't even have to start actually caring about climate change. It will just be solved anyway. Um, And similarly, you know, uh, artificial meat that will be both cheaper and tastier than normal meat and you know, desalination and, you know, plastic eating bacteria and so on. These things are all coming now. So there is no way in the world that we will ever see a point at which the population is rising faster than the carrying capacity of the planet is rising. So how about people who say they are tired of life? Um, I believe there is an increase in mental problems nowadays. Um, how do people cope with eternal life? So the thing is, first of all, one doesn't have to cope with inter eternal life all in one go. You know, we're only going to be getting older one year per year, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, clearly, yes, at the moment, we have a problem of lack of fulfillment, lack of you know, self-worth that exists in society. And that is simply for an obvious reason. It's simply because of lack of education. Everyone who has, uh, you know, has proper education has the ability to make the most of what the world has to offer. And um, that's what, you know, that's what we need to achieve more widely. And of course, the real reason why there is um, lack of education is the fact that education costs a lot of money to provide. Uh, and of course, that is a problem that, again, will be very largely addressed by new technologies, including the elimination of aging will make, the society, make society in general much more prosperous and that prosperity can be in part directed to improving not only kids but also adult education and thereby improving people's self-image, people's self-worth, people's quality of life. Aubrey, is your research somehow correlated with funding? So can you progress faster if you have more money? For sure. The reason why I do so much media and indeed so many, so much, so many talks all over the world is because we need to raise the quality of understanding of this work, the, uh, the understanding that it's really moving and it's foreseeable that we will actually bring aging under complete medical control. We could have probably gone maybe three times faster if we had had maybe just one more digit on the budget that we had and we, we were chugging along on you know, a couple of million dollars per year up to maybe four or five million dollars. Um, 
Now things are a lot better because the private sector has started to get involved. So now we have a whole host of startup companies that are pursuing a number of aspects of this damage repair. And those companies are being very successful in raising the money that allows the science to proceed at a rate that's only limited by the difficulty of the actual science. However, there's still a problem, which is that this private money has only been so far applied to the easier aspects of damage repair. There are still some other aspects that are more challenging and that have not yet reached a sufficient level of proof of concept that they can actually be, um, you know, spun out into startup companies and attract investment. And those areas are still, therefore, being funded only by philanthropy. And that um, sort of money is still far way inadequate. So, yes, we definitely still need quite a lot more money for organizations like Sense Research Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are lots of pharma companies out there and, and health tech and whatever. Um, how do you compete with them or do you even compete with them? We don't really compete with big pharma. In fact, we don't really have much interaction with big pharma yet. Okay. <coughs> big pharma is all about, obviously, you know, taking things all the way to market and making proper profits out of them, which is that at the moment, big pharma makes its money out of people who are sick about keeping people alive in a bad state of health and, you know, spending a lot of money on medicine. And uh, so people might think, well, okay, they wouldn't like the situation in which people were not getting sick because the medicine was being preventative by, by doing this maintenance that stops people from accumulating enough damage to get sick. Um, but I don't think that's true at all, because the thing is, Big Pharma is perfectly happy to do whatever, whatever sells. And so, uh, you know, they've got the, it's the same skill set, the same technologies that will generate preventative medicine. And indeed, there are some examples today, some very big examples of that. Uh, probably the, the two biggest ones are, first of all, statins for high cholesterol and then also ACE inhibitors for um, high blood pressure. Now, in both of these cases, we're treating people who are not yet sick, but those are big, big markets that they sell for. So uh, really all this tells us that really all that matters is to get the society, the general public, more on side with the idea of preventative medicine than, you know, the whole rest of the ecosystem, the um, insurers and the governments and so on will respond to that. So then there will be plenty of money to be made that way and the big firm will just follow the money. Yeah, I see. Wow. So, Aubrey, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, maybe a very last question to you. So yes. what motivates you when you get up in the morning? It's very easy for me to get up in the morning. I have, um, you know, I just look at the numbers, the fact that more than 100,000 people die every day from aging, and indeed that most of those people die after a long period of suffering, of declining and poor health and, you know, dependence and, and disease and general misery. Um, you know, that's pretty easy to get out of bed for. Every day that I bring forward the defeat of aging, I'm effectively saving 100,000 lives. Yeah. Thanks, Aubrey. This was a fantastic session. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.